Thank you. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 14312 in the name of Ruth Maguire on day of the imprisoned winter, uh, writer, I beg your pardon. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Ruth Maguire to open the debate. Ms Maguire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Freedom of expression is a fundamental right. And the need to fight for fundamental rights is not new, of course. It's always been important to protect people around the world from the threat of violence or state suppression. But as with so many things this year, that need feels even sharper. According to Reporters Without Borders, more professional journalists were killed wor worldwide in connection with their work in the first nine months of 2018 than in all of 2017. The Committee to Protect Journalists reports that since 1992, nearly 2,000 journalists and media workers have been killed. And moving beyond journalists alone, according to Deutsche Welle, in 2015, 1,054 authors were attacked, imprisoned, tortured or killed. So protection is vital to ensure that people around the world can express themselves free from the threat of violence. The Day of the Imprisoned Writer is organised by Penn International as a day of solidarity and action for those writers who are denied the right to freedom of expression and who are struggling and fighting for it. I'm very grateful to colleagues from across the chamber for standing in solidarity with persecuted, exiled and imprisoned writers across the globe. And I thank all of those who signed my motion which secured this debate and everyone who's contributing in the chamber today. Each year, Penn highlights the cases of persecuted writers that are emblematic of, the pers of persecution and threats faced by writers and journalists across the world. Last year, in this debate, I spoke about Zara Dogan, and I take no pleasure in seeing that she's one of this year's cases again. I take no pleasure that she's still imprisoned by Turkey, a state who are infamous for their violation of the rights of authors, publishers and academics. Sarah Dogan was born in 1989. She's a painter and the founding editor of the all-female news agency, Gin News Agency, which was closed on the 29th of October 2016 by statutory decree number 675. It is one of over 180 media outlets that have been closed since the beginning of the state of emergency in Turkey. For her work for the agency between 2010 and 2016, she received numerous awards, including the prestigious Metin Gotep Award for her reporting of Yazidi women escaping from ISIS captivity. On the 12th of June 2017, Zera was taken into custody en route to visiting her family. She's in prison as a result of her reporting and her painting being deemed terrorist propaganda by the Turkish state. The painting at issue is her recreation of a photograph taken and distributed by the Turkish military of the Kurdish town of Nusebin following its destruction by Turkish forces. The picture shows destroyed buildings draped with Turkish flags and surrounded by tanks. In her painting, Zera turned the army tanks into huge grotesque creatures consuming innocent civilians. However, Although the Turkish flags were present in the original photograph, Zera was found guilty of painting the Turkish flags on the destroyed buildings, and the painting was condemned as anti-Turkish terrorist propaganda. As Zera herself stated after the ruling, they gave me a prison penalty for taking, for taking, a, picture of, taking a photo of destroyed houses and putting Turkish flags on them. But it wasn't me who did it, it was them. I just painted it. The offending news report featured the following quote from a child who was affected by the clashes in the town. We're hearing the gunfire right now. When the shots intensify, we run to our homes. When the tanks go away, we take to the street to protest. I think we are right. I know our voices will be heard one day. Zera's reporting of these five sentences that were spoken by a child were also deemed terrorist propaganda. I wrote to the Turkish Prime Minister last year expressing my deep concern at the arrest and imprisonment of Zera Dogan and never received a response. Zera is an inspirational and skilled painter and journalist, not a criminal, and I add my voice to the global calls for her immediate and unconditional release. 
Freedom of expression is a fundamental human right and should not be persecuted. It's particularly alarming that this action was taken against an award-winning journalist and painter whose voice has proven crucial in sharing the stories of underrepresented communities. I also understand that the imprisonment of Zera Dogen is unconstitutional, violating Articles 26 and 28 of the Constitution of the Republic of Turkey, which guarantees freedom of expression and a free press, respectively. The Turkey has always been one of the most restrictive countries among the Council of Europe member states in terms of media freedom and freedom of expression, and it's now becoming infamous. infamous. It violates globally recognised norms protecting the right to the freedom of expression and agreements such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, to which Turkey is a party. As per Article 90 of the Constitution, international agreements duly put into effect have the force of law. I again strongly urge Turkey to immediately and unconditionally release the artist and journalist Zera Dogan. She is guilty of no crime. And I say to Zera and to all of those wrongfully imprisoned for simply exercising their fundamental rights, you're not alone, we stand with you, we're proud of your work and your courage, and we will continue to advocate for your freedom. President Officer. Thank you very much. And can I say, as always, as gently to the public area that we do not permit applause in the gallery. I know you feel it with your hearts, just let it stay there, but not to applaud. And uh, you may wish to take the opportunity, Ms. Maguire, to welcome uh, the, the folk to the gallery. You may do so now, if you wish. Presiding officer, I'd like to welcome um, representatives from Penn International and Amnesty International to the gallery. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, now the open debate, I call Annabel Ewing to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Ms Ewing, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I would like at the outset to congratulate uh, Ruth McGuire on securing this important debate today. And it is entirely fitting that on the day of the imprisoned writer, this Parliament is marking the occasion, and I fully support Ruth McGuire's calls in her motion for this Parliament to officially recognise the day of the imprisoned writer. In preparing for today's debate, Presiding Officer, I was struck uh, by the information that Ruth McGuire has already uh, quoted from and information about the statistics involved. So I think it is worth stressing this uh, really uh, shocking information. So we have heard uh, that reporters without borders uh, have uh, reported that uh, more professional journalists were killed worldwide in connection with their work in the first nine months of 2018 than in all of 2017. I, I do feel that that uh, information is worth uh, reiterating because it puts in very stark focus uh, the uh, really uh, terrible uh, uh, prevalence of this uh, problem that we see uh, right across uh, the world. And these shocking statistics, presiding officer, do demonstrate the continuing and pressing need for each of us to be vigilant, to defend freedom of expression here in Scotland and uh, right across the world. And surely we all have a duty to stand shoulder to shoulder with those writers who are being persecuted simply for speaking out. And we must do all that we can to ensure that their voices are heard and are not silenced. Marking the day of the imprisoned writer, therefore, affords us the opportunity to do just that by highlighting individual cases across uh, the world. And, and Ruth McGuire has highlighted the particular case uh, that she referred to. And in that vein, I would uh, like to raise the case uh, flagged up by Penn. And I, I apologize to all concerned if I don't get pronunciations correct, but I'll do my best, of Beruz Bukhani. Now, he, uh, uh, his country of origin is Iran. He holds a master's degree in political uh, science, political geography and geopolitics. He is a Kurdish Iranian writer, journalist, scholar, cultural advocate and filmmaker. In Iran, he worked as a journalist for several newspapers, including National Dailies uh, and the Kurdish language monthly magazine Varia. Bukhani uh, claims that due to his focus on business and politics, he was subject to constant uh, surveillance by the uh, Iranian uh, uh, authorities and in 2013 he was reportedly arrested, interrogated and threatened, threatened by the Iranian intelligence services.
Fearing that he would be imprisoned, he fled Iran on 13th May 2013. And after he left Iran, he was rescued at sea by the Australian Navy, whom he asked for asylum. Due to Australia's offshore processing policies, Buhani was taken to Manus Island's Regional Processing Centre at Lombroom, Papua New Guinea. And in April 26, he was accorded refugee status in Papua, Papua New Guinea. While detained, he has faced harassment for reporting to the Australian media and other organisations on conditions inside the detention centre uh, and the alleged uh, human rights abuses uh, taking place there. He reports being the target of beatings as a direct result of his reporting. After Manus Island Processing Centre was closed, Bukhari was relocated to a refugee transit centre where I understand that he remains to this day in a sort of no man's land uh, limbo, presiding officer. So uh, that is just one case highlighted by Penn. Obviously, there are many, many more individuals that we could talk about, and I'm sure uh, other members will raise specific cases as well. Uh, we don't have time to, to mention all of the, 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 the cases flagged by Penn, but I think it is important to, to bear witness, if you like, to uh, such individual cases. I will conclude, presiding officer, by stressing that we include in our thoughts and in our deliberations all of these writers across the world who have been in prison simply for speaking out. And I'm sure that we all commend the bravery and the determination of these writers. Uh, and by participating in this debate today in our Scottish Parliament, uh, it is important, therefore, that our Parliament is playing its part in ensuring that the voices of these writers are not silenced. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Ewing. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Alex Rowley. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have the opportunity to take part in today's uh, debate, and I congratulate uh, Ruth Maguire on bringing this to the Chamber. As Ruth's motion acknowledges, today is known in the literary circles as the day of the imprisoned writer. This is a day when people are invited to stand up and support uh, the persecuted, exiled and imprisoned writers across the globe, acknowledging uh, what they see as an international decline in free expression. Many of such examples uh, are recently documented by the organisation of Penn International, and I'm delighted that representatives are here this afternoon uh, in the chamber. And I'm particularly harrowing and cruel. However, many of these examples of governments or religious motivated acts against writers and journalists must also be remembered, condemned and acted upon. One such that uh, I remember as a young uh, son myself was the, uh, the writing that was put forward by uh, Salman Rushdie. Uh, uh, and as a youngster, I, I, I took on board some of the difficulties that he was experiencing by expressing his views uh, and opinions. Uh, he was a British Indian novelist and essay writer and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. His second novel, Midnight Children, won the Booker Prize back in 1981 and he was deemed to be the best novelist of all writers in two separate occasions uh, on the 25th and the 40th anniversary of that prize. And it was his fourth novel, uh, The Sardonic Verses, which uh, when, he, when he published that in 1988, which generated particular uh, uh, reaction from individuals. Uh, and uh, that, uh, as I say, was the first time that I started to, to think about writers and how they would express themselves and the individuals and the circumstances they found themselves in. So Penn International have been campaigning uh, for the freedom of writers uh, since 1921 and priority campaigning on behalf of many uh, individuals because they see and they knew uh, that what was occurring uh, across certain parts of the world uh, was something that should be recognized and should be condemned. Uh, today, also serves as a, a commemoration of those who have been killed from the previous year uh, of imprisoned writers. And over the years, uh, dear presiding officer, dozens of writers and journalists from around the world have been killed in circumstances which appear to be related to their profession and only to their profession. And that is totally unacceptable uh, and utterly un unacceptable, as I said. Individuals should have the right to express their views and their opinions without persecution or imprisonment or even death. And Amnesty International have played a major role in this, uh, and they should be commended and congratulated for the work that they've done uh, in to ensure that imprisoned writers get acknowledgement. They acknowledge that the world, uh, that people who are persecuted, tortured or imprisoned uh, for writing about uh, individuals and governments and their own countries is, is you know, that, that is a, a freedom that we uh, would expect 
to have. Uh, and other people across the world do not have that right, do not have that opportunity. Many well-known writers and journalists who have also stood up for and, and backed individuals who found themselves in that position have also put themselves in the line of danger. Topics such as children's rights, LGBT equality, Syria, Russia, the United States, global refugee crisis, these have all highlighted uh, that, that what individuals want to say, but they've found themselves in harm's way for even contemplating to discuss that and to write about that. Uh, and I, I, I com commend and congratulate uh, Ruth Maguire for bringing this very emotive subject today. It's vitally important that we as politicians ensure that our voices are heard, that we stand up and are counted on to ensure that individuals have the right to express their views and their opinions in verbal or written form. Democracy is the cornerstone to our nation. We have the privilege to serve, but we must also have the responsibility to ensure that other nations who do not have the same beliefs, the same standards, the same liberties as we do, are challenged for their lack of understanding and help to account for their actions and held to account for their actions, because that's vitally important. These individuals have a right and we have a right to support them. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you, President Officer. I would uh, want to begin by also thanking Ruth Maguire for bringing forward the motion for this debate to take place today in the Scottish Parliament. I'm also grateful to Scottish Pen and Amnesty International for providing materials to support the debate. It is right that, that we have this debate, but it's also right that as parliamentarians in Scotland, we think how we can work with these organisations to continue to put pressure on governments, highlight the issues that are being raised. For in 1948, the United Nations said in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that freedom of opinion and expression implies the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Now in the turn of the 21st century, nearly half of the world population still lacks access to free information. So it is indeed very fitting that today, November the 15th, alongside Penn International and other Penn centres, Scottish Penn will mark the day of the imprisoned writer by promoting and celebrating the freedom to write, calling for justice and freedom for persecuted, imprisoned and murdered writers across the world. And raising awareness of this issue is more important today than it has ever been for, as Ruth Maguire and others have said, according to Reporters Without Borders, more professional journalists were killed worldwide in connection with their work in the first nine months of 2018 than all of in 2017. So that is scandalous and it is also important to make the point that the UK continues to work with many countries and we claim to be partners with many countries, trade with many countries where these types of persecutions are happening. And this persecution and murder goes beyond journalists to affect authors and media workers. Turning to the motion and the information provided, they make for chilling reading. It is clear that the attempts to silence journalists are coming from states and also from powerful bodies within states. Power is being abused through imprisonment, physical attacks, torture and death to protect the vested interests and to sustain a state apparatus which dominates society and monopolises most of the wealth within those societies. Events as set out in the motion and the briefing appear on the face of it to be far removed from our relatively safe and secure democratic society here in Scotland. But to ignore the threat to free speech and to continue as if it was only happening in another place is to disrespect the memory of those who have lost their lives in defence of free speech and ignore the courage and sacrifice being made every day around the world to fight for free speech. It is therefore very important here in Scotland that we stand in solidarity with oppressed and imprisoned writers and to ensure their voice cannot be silenced. There are pen centres in over 100 countries whose aims include defending freedom of speech and writing against many of the threats to its survival 
uh, which the modern world poses. I'm pleased to stand with them today in the Scottish Parliament and with all parties here uh, on this day of the imprisoned writer. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley, and I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Gillian Martin. Ms Martin will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Whiteman. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Presiding Officer, and thank you to Ruth Maguire uh, for bringing this important debate to Parliament. I declare a, an interest as a member of Scottish PEN. Uh, this summer I was uh, very pleased to attend a performance in Edinburgh by, by Pussy Riot, uh, and afterwards was pleased to get the chance to speak to one of the band members, Maria Aliokina. And I discussed the state of Russian democracy, and in particular the plight of the imprisoned Ukrainian filmmaker and writer Oleg Sentsov. Maria has been campaigning loudly and clearly for the release of Oleg and knows a thing or two about Russian persecution of artists having herself been imprisoned for two years for singing a song critical of Vladimir Putin. Maria asked me to raise his case in the parliament, and I'm pleased to be able to do so today. Uh, Oleg was born in Simferopol in 1976, a city on the... Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine, which is now the capital of Russian-occupied Crimea. He has two children, Alina, aged 15, and Vladislav, who is 14. Oleg is a filmmaker and a writer, and after participating in the Euromaidan protest in Ukraine in late 2013, uh, he was arrested on 10th May 2014 at his home by members of the Russian Security Service, the FSB. According to Amnesty International, his arrest was a barbaric affair. <coughs> The officers placed a plastic bag, bag over his head and suffocated him until he passed out. They then threatened him with rape and murder to force him to confess to organized bombings, possessing illegal firearms and other terrorist acts, including membership of the Ukrainian right-wing group Pravy Sector. A fortnight, ago, he was, a fortnight later, he was transferred to Moscow, over 1,400 kilometers away, where he was placed in pre-trial pre -trial detention uh, for a year. Oleg denies all his charges, but after a show trial before a military court where not one single piece of evidence was presented, he was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Political figures in civil society in the EU and the US have condemned this ver verdict, including his network of peers at the European Film Academy, where famous filmmakers including Pedro Almodovar, Ken Loach and Wim Wenders have vociferously objected to his detention. Through a succession of prison transfers, Oleg is now held in what international observers report as inhumane conditions at a penal colony in Lyabtyangi, a small Siberian town above the Arctic Circle, 5,000 kilometers from his home. In May this year, four years after his arrest, Oleg began a hunger strike to seek the release of all Ukrainian nationals currently imprisoned in Russia on politically motivated grounds. After suffering from excruciating heart and kidney problems, he ended his hunger strike after 145 days, an action in which he lost 30 kilograms in weight and now has irrevocable damage to his health. Despite the authorities routinely denying him access to appropriate medical care and contact with the outside world, Oleg has been a critical and per persuasive force. The European Union, for example, commended him for his actions that have shown incredible courage, determination and selflessness in his fight for freedom for all of those who've un been unfairly convicted on politically uh, motivated grounds. Presiding officer, Oleg Sensov is an innocent man. Just a few weeks ago, he was awarded the prestigious European Parliament Sakharov Prize for freedom of thought. And so it's fitting that in the 2018, the 30th anniversary of the Sakharov Prize, the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, that Oleg Sensov is honored in this way. The Russian Federation ranks 148th in the latest World Press Freedom Index, and more bloggers and journalists are detained now in Russia than at any time since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Presiding officer, we must keep Oleg Sensov and all those suffering unjust imprisonment and detention in the public eye, and as public figures, we have special responsibilities in not giving succor to repressive regimes such as the Russian Federation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I want to thank my friend and colleague Ruth McGuire for once again bringing our attention to the important work of Scottish Pen and Amnesty International and giving us all a chance to air the stories of those whose voices are silenced. 
As we have this debate in, today in the Scottish Parliament, 29-year-old Abad Yaya is stranded in Doha in Qatar and is unable to return home to Palestine. Abad is a, a fiction writer and it was ordered that all copies of his novel, Crime in Ramallah, were confiscated because of what they deemed to be offensive language. He's been the victim of a hate campaign on social media, he suffered death threats and copies of his novel were reportedly burnt on the Gaza Strip. Crime in Ramallah tells the story of three Palestinian men who work in a bar where the murder of a young woman takes place. And it goes on to chart how the murder affects each man's life and explores the themes of politics, religion and homosexuality through its protagonists. And the language used to explore these, these important themes has been used against him to silence him and remove his rights. Abad Yaya received a summons from the Attorney General as well as the book's publisher and distributor, Fad Al Alik, who was reportedly arrested and held for six hours as well. Um, his right to freedom of speech has been taken and he's left fearing for his life. Uh, Sal Salil Tripathi, the chair of Penn International's Rights in Prison Committee, said this, it is appalling that Abad Yaya cannot return home because he fears he may be arrested over a novel he has written. The response to his novel was not only disproportionate, it's entirely out of place. Abad Yaya's novel may have challenged political and religious orthodoxy, but he has the right to express his thoughts. The Palestinian Authority should take immediate steps to overturn the ban and ensure that he'll be able to return home safely and be protected from any of those threats. Abad Yaya sh um, should be able to return home without fear of prosecution and danger. And his book should be allowed to be read once more um, and the charges against him should be dropped. Banning books and, and novels and imprisoning their writers, as we know from history, is a very sure sign that a society has gone very wrong. And all of us sitting here reserve the right to question and criticise our political system. It's our job and it's our right, and I would always argue vociferously, vociferously that it's also the job and the right of every Scottish citizen. And we have, must say, as so many people have said, um, when we see when those rights are taken away from other people across the world, we must use our voices to defend them and argue for their rights. We are uh, fortunate to express our views through writing without any fear of arrest, because we live in a democracy. Um, I was struck as well, um, Ruth McGuire talked about uh, Zara Dogan. Um, and she highlighted again in her excellent speech, and she has uh, mentioned Zara Dogan before. The uh, first time I heard of her was when Banksy um, did a, a mural in, in, in defence of her um, and asking for her conviction to be overturned. He produced a piece of street art uh, with her behind bars. Uh, and it's acts like this and this debate that today are important in drawing their attention to the injustice of silencing artistic expression and freedom of speech. Some members will know that, um, I'll know I'm, I'm, I'm not a great artist by any means, that I've in past created political art. Um, art I created in 2014 and 15 around the Scottish independence question was highly critical of the UK Tory-led government and the Labour Party's campaign to deny Scotland its independence. M myself and my sister established a touring art show in 2014 with art representing the call for independence over 50 artists and if we were in, in Turkey um, we'd all be facing conviction and I think it's really important that we recognise that we have those, those freedoms um, that others don't. So I commend the work of Penn giving us a chance to hear the stories of the injustices perpetrated in writers, artists, journalists and filmmakers throughout the world and again to Ruth McGuire for securing this debate. Presiding officer. Thank you. I call Christina McKelvey to close the Government Minister, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I uh, thank Ruth Maguire for raising this subject in debate today and all the members uh, for their contributions and join them in expressing my support for the Day of the Imprisoned Writer. I also want to thank uh, Scottish Pen, Amnesty International and others for all the work that they do to raise awareness of the persecution faced by many writers throughout the world. It is essential that we call for freedom and justice for imprisoned, murderers, uh, imprisoned mur and murdered writers. Uh, presiding officer in Scotland, we defend fiercely the right to say what we think, and we do it very often. Like most rights, we often take it for granted, which we do very often, and it is only when it comes under threat that we realise how important that is. 
As Scottish Pen, Amnesty and others have highlighted, journalists, poets, bloggers, novelists, artists, filmmakers in Africa, Asia, South America, Europe, the Middle East have all suffered threats, attacks, imprisonment, been exiled and even killed for their activities. And despite the United Nations declaring the 2nd of November the International Day to end impunity for crimes against journalists, many of these violations go unchallenged and, more importantly, unpunished. Let's look at some of the people who I would wish to highlight in, in response to Ruth Maguire's debate today. Daphne Karuna Galizia, who was murdered by a car bomb in October 2017, following her work exposing corruption connected to the Panama Papers. Or Dawit Isaac, a poet, playwright and journalist, was arrested in 2001 and was reported to have been tortured and kept in solitary confinement in Eritrea for the last eight years. And in Turkey, of which we've heard much today, writers and journalists, just like Zera Dogan, highlighted by Ruth Maguire today, remain in prison, many of them being caught up in the wave of repression following the failed coup attempt in 2016. And turning to Myanmar, Wa Loan and Cho So U, who were sentenced to seven years in prison for re reporting on military violence against the Rohingya people. And presiding officer, none of us could have been any less horrified because the whole world was by the brutal murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi just over a month ago. And let's turn to someone I've met. I've met Rafe Badawi, Badawi's wife, Ensav. And Rafe Badawi remains in prison in Saudi Arabia, having been sentenced to 10 years and 1,000 lashes for daring to write a blog. The barbarity of the treatment he has, subjected, has been subjected to is absolutely appalling. Presiding officer, the reason why I highlight these people is because none of them are criminals. They have been attacked, oppressed and murdered because they have worked to expose truths that are unwelcome. They have suffered for daring to challenge and daring to question. Yet they're working doing something that we in Scotland consider to be a public service. Their crime is to have worked to promote informed debate and to support the exchange of facts and opinions. Reading and hearing these accounts forces us to reflect on the difference that human rights makes in our own lives. And Ruth Maguire painted a very vivid picture in her opening speech on that. I had a very similar experience when I spoke to three human rights defenders participating in the Scottish Human Rights Defenders Fellowship at Dundee University. And I hope that this uh, fellowship will go some way in reassuring Alec Rowley that the Scottish Government is taking seriously our responsibility to international solidarity to stand against these things. So in the year of the 20th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Human, defenders, human Rights Defenders, the fellowship is one good example of how we in Scotland can stand shoulder to shoulder with people who put themselves and their families at considerable risk to defend the human rights they are entitled to. So let's look a wee bit at human rights in Scotland. The rights that the fellows and the writers um, that we have heard from uh, about today uh, are working to uphold. Those rights are incredibly important, often in the face of incredible difficulties and powerful opposition. These rights that we hold, um, we are fortunate to hold, but they should be protected both internationally and in Scotland. And this year, presiding officer, we mark the 17th anniversary of the U U Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The rights it contains and gives to all of us belong to all of us in equal measure, no matter who we are or where we come from. And turning to freedom of expression, of which there's been a lot said today, the right to freedom ex of expression and opinion are contained in the European Convention of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights has consistently described them as essential foundations for a democratic society. These rights have been given practical effect in Scotland through the Human Rights Act. Alexander Stewart reminded us of, uh, of the, the right to freedom expression when he spoke about the world reaction to the writings of Salman Rushdie and the right of people to express their feelings on that, a very powerful example indeed. But we've heard much about art and culture and poetry and writing and, and, and books that today. So I want to talk a wee bit about what we are doing for culture and literature in, Scot literature in Scotland, which would hopefully add to our international solidarity. So alongside the government's responsibility to uphold and protect human rights, uh, human rights and the freedom of expression, it is our duty to promote cultural activity. And we do really enjoy it, don't we? Including in ways that we can enable literature uh, and writing to flourish. And in highlighting the songs of Pussy Riot, Andy Whiteman demonstrates the power of culture and the risk creative people take every single day in expressing this right. And I would hope that Oleg's story tells us absolutely clearly how important it is to maintain and uphold that creativity. 
because we all have a right to participation in cultural life and a responsibility to support and protect literary and artistic endeavour. And we are very, very proud to help support Scotland's world-class cultural system. Gillian Martin raised uh, the issue about Abad Yaya and the rights to freedom of thought and the book that, that, that he had written. And next week, the seventh annual Book Week Scotland, which demonstrates the Scottish Government's commitment to literature and ensuring that more people can enjoy reading, hopefully inspired to write, just like Abad too. And as well as protecting core grant funding, we have made available an additional £6.6 .6 million pounds to Creative Scotland to guarantee the next uh, three financial years to support that artistic endeavour across Scotland. This is just one aspect of the Scotland we are trying to create, presiding officer, where human rights, dignity and equality are embedded at the heart of everything we do. And as we mark the importance of the written word in today's debate, I want to affirm that as a government, we intend to put our words into practice to take the action necessary to make human rights real for each and every one of us. We're building dignity, fairness and respect into our social security system. That's one example. The government has been clear in its insistence that the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights be retained in UK law um, following the withdrawal of the European Union but whether that might have all changed for the whole the time that we've been in the chamber today presiding officer but I want to conclude Annabel Ewan said that we bear witness to the, the persecution and we raise our voice in solidarity in our parliament today and she's absolutely right Joseph Conrad presiding officer described the written word as having power power to make you hear to make you feel and to make you see so as we mark the day of imprisoned writer and reflect on the individual highlights by Scottish Pen and others, their stories give us insight into the acute importance of human rights and the terrible consequences when they are ignored and neglected. The only appropriate response that we can make is to stand with those who suffer for raising their voices and make it our ambition to do all we can to ensure that freedom of expression is maintained throughout the world. I lend my support to Ruth Maguire's motion today. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament till 2.30.